you're listening to dialectradio.co.uk. Now, Bristol's role in the English Civil War. We don't get taught anywhere near enough about this, and a centre has opened in Newark in Nottinghamshire just last summer uh, to really take people through what the English Civil War was all about. It's called, surprisingly enough, the English Civil War Centre. Now, Bristol's role is actually connected up with Newark to a certain extent because Prince Rupert, who was the king's chief, keeping hold of Bristol for the king, had to surrender the city after it was surrounded by Cromwell and his roundheads. Uh, And as a result, he had to go ride up to Newark to see the king, where the king actually court-martialed him for giving up the city of Bristol. Prince Rupert was quite a character, a very tall guy, and we'll hear a bit about him in a minute. Uh, But uh, luckily, (laughs) luckily for Prince Rupert, he was exonerated because there was really no choice. Bristol was running out of food, etc. But uh, the Civil War is an absolutely fascinating area of study, which we don't get taught about very much in our schools, although other parts of the world, they do get taught about the English Civil War because it had a massive consequence, really starting the birth of capitalism across the world and also paving the way for the British Empire and paving the way for industrialisation by evicting many of the peasants from the land after the Civil War. So let's hear now from Richard Darn from the English Civil War Centre. My name's Richard Darn and I work with the National Civil War Centre. Um, truth be known, the Civil War Museum, the UK's only one, the only one that tells the full story, could be placed in a number of places. It could be in Bristol, it could be in Worcester, it could be places like that. But Newark's got a very, very good claim because it was um, a royally stronghold. It was never taken by a feat of arms. Um, Nottinghamshire is where the Civil War starts, in effect, because King Charles raises his standard at Nottingham. And it effectively ends here, at least the first phase of it, in 1646, when Charles comes to the outskirts of Newark and effectively surrenders to the Scottish army surrounding the place. So uh, tell, tell us a bit about the causes of the war. Well, the causes of the war are quite complicated, and I think historians still argue about them, but it's essentially about the way the country's governed, essentially. It's about whether authority and power is focused on the person of the king, and certainly the Stuart kings, James and Charles, his son, certainly had a very strong belief in the divine right of kings. And they thought Parliament was there, really, just to rubber stamp their tax-raising ambitions. But, of course, I think things have progressed somewhat by then and there were factions in the country that thought, no, we want to be consulted more closely. And essentially, there was a number of issues that arose around that. There was taxation without representation. There was religious um, reasons for the eventual war. There was a perception that Charles was very high Anglican and he married a Roman Catholic wife. Um, And that, particularly on the Puritan side of things, that rather got them going against him. So all in all, there were a number of streams, really, that came together um, to make conflict almost inevitable by by 1640. We're in the main gallery of the Civil War Centre, so in front of, as you can see, all sorts of stuff, some of the armour-worn buff coats. And we also try to tell a story here about the way the Civil War really starts. And I I suppose the, uh, the the match is struck, really, with the accession of King James, James I of England and VI of Scotland, Um, to the throne in 1603 with the death of Elizabeth. And from that point onwards, um, um, James had a a very, very firm belief in his own divine right to rule. He thought he was basically a little god on earth. And, of course, King Charles, his son, when he came to the throne in in, um, 1625, he had very similar thoughts to his father as well. Um, How did this... sounds very headstrong. How did this affect the general population and also the merchant class, I suppose, were really the main force behind the war? Yeah, well, as economic trends are developing, you're getting a merchant class as a strong middle class, if you like, developed. And people, I think, by that stage just thought that they deserved a right to be consulted. I mean, the king has got some ambitious plans, but he doesn't have very much money. And the only way a king can get a money under the way the English system operated was by calling a parliament. As far as he was concerned, certainly James, King James, was very used to a very compliant Scottish parliament, whereby he called it and they gave him what he needed. Um, The English tradition is somewhat more radical in parliament, and and they felt very strongly that if they were going to be called upon to raise funds to fight wars off some of the king's projects, they needed a say in those projects. And again, the religious um, divides that were renting through society were also very sort of fundamental sort of reasons for the war. And what we do in this room, we try to take that story from James and through the period, 
And indeed, after the period as well, when we get, um, I suppose, this room really closes with the Glorious Revolution, where some of the aims of Parliament in the Civil War, you know, thwarted by the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, are actually met, if you like, later on, when um, with William coming to the throne and basically the, the Parliament, or the, the great men of, of, of England, basically kicking the king out, essentially, and, and getting a new king in. It was almost like wanting a chairman of the board. Not a, not a chief executive any longer. This is one of the stories that's hardly ever told in Britain, isn't it, about the uh, the flight of Charles II, who was the Charles I's son, was actually on the run, wasn't he, running across Britain? Well, he was, because, I mean, he, he came back to fight and in 1651, of course. He, um, he, he takes on Cromwell and uh, basically the parliamentary authorities in uh, the Battle of Worcester, 3rd of September, and, and, of course, he loses. He hides in an oak tree... And he basically goes into exile. He's essentially a king without a kingdom at that point. The Scots have proclaimed him their king, but that doesn't really matter because England doesn't really go along with that, and effectively he gets kicked out. Um, so and he was almost was, like a kind of prisoner on the run uh, yeah. in the countryside in disguise, that kind of thing. He was. He eventually escapes abroad, um, uh, and he's kept safe by his supporters. At that point onwards... Um, and just before, obviously, England is effectively a republic. It, it doesn't need a king. The thing that nobody could conceive of in 1642 in England without a king comes to pass. England is a republic. So what about the uh, point of the Civil War? Because it's almost as if once the Restoration happens, the, the whole point of the war is over. You know, it's like they, they've uh, lost the kings back again. Yeah, that, that's, it, it, when you read the story about it, the, 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 the twos and fro's, it's... it's it, there is that tendency to think, well, my God, what was all that about? I mean, we lost, in England, a conservative estimate is that 5% of the entire population of England was killed during the Civil War period through either fighting, about 60,000 through fighting, the rest through disease. In Scotland um, and Ireland, it, it could be up to half the population. So what on earth was that all about if we get a king back? But I think it's a king back in a very different country and the scars of war... We might not talk about it, but they're never going to be forgotten. And certainly the, the, the king, part of the condition that he comes back is that he, he says he's not going to go and hunt these people down and settle old scores. He does that to a certain extent with the people that signed his father's death warrant, the regicides. But I think Charles II knew the limits by that stage of his actions. And if he wanted to be king, then he had to be careful and tread very carefully. And he certainly did. He, he was certainly a... Um, he certainly had healthier sexual appetites than his father, that's for sure, because he, he's, um, he's, he's, um, his romantic liaisons are, are sort of um, legendary, but, but he also seemed a much wiser character and wiser for the experience. And when he does go too hard after the regicides and people in the old Commonwealth, his advisers take him to one side and say, this has proven unpopular in the country, they don't want you to do this. And this is, this is the memory that we've forgotten, isn't it? The memory about how do you settle a country after a civil war. And it's still relevant today, but how on earth do you do that? Do you simply not talk about it? Because all the issues that have split the country were worth having a war about, so what are you going to do when you've got the peace? Are you just basically going to pick an argument after you've had too much to drink? In a pub? No, what happens is it's an easy peace, essentially, and, of course, the Republicans don't go away in 1660. They're still here in the 1660s. They're pointing to the Great Fire of London as, as God's punishment for the restoration of the monarchy. So nothing changes in a way, but what does change is we don't talk about it as much um, in the 1660s. We try to forget it and move on because the scars are just simply too deep. Now, we've got a children's party coming through right now. Uh, how, what do you, how do you rate the way that generally the, the civil war is taught in Britain? Because I know certainly people I've spoken to, a lot of them are a bit, pretty much clueless. Well, it wasn't taught, was it? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but we never were taught anything about the Civil War at school. It was a, a mystery to us. You know, French Revolution, I'm sure French children learned that. The Irish Uprising, I'm sure the Irish children. American Revolution, yep. English, nope. You don't get any of that, I'm afraid. So things have slightly changed in the last few years because the curriculum has been changed, and so now it's, it's pretty much compulsory that you study this origins of church and state. To do that without mentioning the Civil War is virtually impossible. So that's why we've got a very big education programme here. So we're looking at school children finding out about this period. And I can assure you, when I was the age of these children, what are these, about eight, nine children, eight, nine years old, 
it was certainly never learned anything like this. I mean, as far as I was concerned, it was kings, queens, and that was it. Another, another aspect of the Civil War, of course, is the, is the Puritans. One of the things that we often don't realise is that they went into churches, into cathedrals, and tore down a lot of the statues and that kind of thing. And this is an important part of our history. We do need to understand why our uh, monuments like that are as they are. Yeah, abs- absolutely. It's very much like remembering that the monasteries are ruins because of Henry VIII. Well, a lot of the churches and the glass has been ruined because of because of the Commonwealth troops. And even to bring it up to date, we've had more recently ISIS, haven't we, going into the uh, the various ancient monuments in Palmyra and Syria and places like that, and just oops, and destroying those. <laughs> That's a bit of armour coming out. <laughs> what the kids will do shortly, they'll start dressing up, and it's proven quite popular. And it, Actually bringing history to life when we've got no video of that period, we've got no photographs, it's not like we're teaching the Civil, uh, First World War, so you have to work around it, and so the kids will get all this armour on and feel the weight of it and just how a struggle it was, but coming back to your early point, absolutely right, you, we've got factions here absolutely convinced that they're right, and at that point are prepared to, yeah, uh, to shut up um, monuments and to yeah, do all the things that they did, slighting places... It's well worth pointing out that there were some moderate voices at the time, probably the most um, um, moderate of all um, the Civil War, great figures of the Civil War. There's probably four great figures of the Civil War to cut to the chase. Charles Rupert, who was defending Bristol. Fairfax, who was commander-in-chief of the Parliamentary Armies, and Cromwell, of course. Fairfax, in particular, comes across through history as the most moderate, reasonable kind of guy, and he, he effectively lays siege to York, the great royalist stronghold in the north, they lay siege to it um, the parliamentarians um, win that siege so they take it from the royalists and he physically stops his own troops from shattering the glass of York Minster he physically stops them and when um, Fairfax goes into Oxford, he gets Oxford another, the royalist capital he actually puts guards on the Ashmolean Museum and places like this to make sure that they're not despoiled by the troops, is a man, a moderate man, and he comes down through the ages as a moderate man that wants to protect culture. Um, but he's obviously evinced of the parliamentarian cause. He's their commander-in-chief. So, so what's the connection between Bristol and Newark, anyway? <laughs> well, it's not a very good one, I've got to say, because um, Bristol wasn't good news for us. Should we move to one side and let the children dress yeah, up? Sorry, we're right in the way there. I think we They've are. got all the, all the costumes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Yeah, essentially, um, New York's a royalist stronghold. Bristol becomes a royalist stronghold when it's taken by, by the royalists from parliamentarians in, in 43. Got to be said, 1643 was a golden year for the royalist cause. It was a high water mark. After then, things go downhill for them. But Bristol eventually does get taken by the parliamentarians. And, of course, that's a terrific blow to Charles, absolutely nailing the coffin-type blow. It's his big port on the West Coast. It's his hope of bringing an Irish army across. It's a savage blow to him. And, of course, he wanted Bristol defending at all costs. Rupert was a professional soldier. Rupert didn't believe in dying for lost causes. He made terms with Parliament. He gets escorted out un- under terms. And at that point, he comes to Newark where the king is to explain his actions to the king about why he's let, he's let the place well, fall. It must have been a bit of a frosty encounter. It was. By all accounts, it really was a frosty encounter because you've got to remember Prince Rupert is by far and away the king's most ablest commander. He's the one that the parliamentarians have feared from day one of the war. He's by far their best commander. It's a little bit reckless and a little bit headstrong, but he's got a proven track record. He was the guy that lifted the second siege of Newark when he came with a dashing cavalry charge, so nobody disputes his military prowess. But the king was so devastated by this loss... Um, Rupert was court-martialed on charges of cowardice. He was exonerated. But nonetheless, there was a, a fundamental schism now between the King and Rupert, and Rupert effectively rides out of the civil war at that point. But Rupert's troops, who he's brought from Bristol, carry some very unwelcome guests with them, and these are fleas, and they're, it's the plague, basically, they bring to Newark. So not only is Newark under siege for six months, cut off from the outside world, it was a very bitter winter, surrounded by... 17,000 troops, half of them Scots professional troops, half English. Um, very, very short of food. Typhus breaks out in the winter. Um, and then come the warmer months, plague breaks out that Rupert's troops have brought here. And, of course, the siege was over here in, in May '46. That's when the First Civil War ends. But the suffering didn't end in Newark. The plague continues until the end of that year. 
And in fact, some estimates have said that Newark really didn't recover from the entire siege for 100 years because the surrounding pasture had been stripped to provide the earthworks that defended the town. So Newark goes into a 100-year depression, which really tells you something about the effects of that war. You know, once you put down your Ladybird book of history and the colourful photos, you realise that the legacy of war lasts a long, long time. Well, that's another question, isn't it? I mean, for really villages who were um, away from the action, you know, the main action was taking place around the big cities and big towns. Uh, what was life like for people just out, you know, as most of the population were, it was an agrarian population at the time, out in the villages? Well, absolutely right. And, of course, uh, the Civil War, the thing about the English Civil War, or the British Civil Wars, as we call it, more accurate, it's spread across all the four kingdoms, everybody was affected. It wasn't, a, you might want to say, well, I'm going to step outside this conflict, I want nothing to do, do with it. I'm sure a lot of people did. Yeah, well, a lot of people did, but the conflict would find you. So, for instance, let's consider there are, um, the Scots enter the war <clears throat> on the side of Parliament. They get paid for doing that, by the way. They get the charge Parliament £150,000 to lay siege to Newark. So it comes down with about 7,000 troops to lay siege to parts of Newark. Then the English around the other areas, about eight, nine thousand 9,000 troops. So they're all there. Um, the Scots come down their cavalry. They have to be billeted somewhere because this siege lasts for six months and it's a really, really bitter winter. We're in the mini ice age. It's a really bitter winter. So you've got to actually put these guys up somewhere. So just thinking about it, isn't it it's roughly the same time that the Thames fro- froze over? Yeah, absolutely. So we know from a fact these are very, very cold winters. Um, yeah, they need pay in, their horses need hay, they need somewhere to sleep. They can't all sleep out in the open because they're going to freeze to death. So they get billeted all around. And in the Civil War, uh, you had to billet troops for free, essentially. They'd come, they'd probably raid your larder they would plunder. We know the Scots were plundering because we've got petitions from people as far away as in this area, South Yorkshire. That's about 30, 40, 50 miles away. I suppose they would be told by their commanding officers, go and get some food, go and get this, go and get that, materials for the war. Yeah, they weren't supposed to, but we all know armies are like. You know, it wasn't just parliamentarian army that did this or Scots army. They did what all armies do and still do. They, they basically plunder the resources of the local community because the, the, the military priority is the priority, if you like, and and again, we know there are loads of petitions. Um, uh, uh, an academic colleague of mine from Warwick University has done a paper on this and he was trying to work out when it was just xenophobia against the Scots that resulted in so many complaints and petitions being presented to Parliament. And effectively, I think his conclusion was, well, what did you ex- expect the Scots to do? They're hundreds of miles away from home, they've got no food, they've got no billets, they're not provided. So what do they do? And, and this is why the war becomes very unpopular, because the royalists do exactly the same when they march to an area. They either plunder, they take, and they, they, you have to give them free billets. What about, uh, I mean, you just talking there about the, uh, the, the, the academic interest in this. I mean, does that tally with the fact that this hasn't really been taught, uh, taught a lot at university schools, that sort of thing, maybe more at university? But do you think there's still a, a bit of a gold seam of material out there that we can be looking at and re-understanding? Because I know after the Second World War there was quite a lot of research into the Civil War by uh, academics like Christopher Hill, etc., that dug out a whole new seam of material. Yeah, a- absolutely. And, and uh, We're fortunate because there is so much that survives from this period. Of course, we've got so many tracks, tracks at the start of the newspaper industry. And, you know, the siege of Newark, the fall of Newark, in May was being reported in London with printed magazines essentially tracked three days later I mean that's quicker than a weekly newspaper can get the news out so yeah we've got all that Um, there's also a a really um, interesting project I mentioned to you about petitions well once the war is um, underway and then concluded and Parliament effectively wins there are any number of petitions to Parliament for for welfare payments for, for veterans for people that have lost arms for people that have lost husbands breadwinners and so a whole welfare state system starts, and there are petitions for, for pensions. The first national pension scheme is introduced in this period by Parliament. And, of course, a lot of those, peten- those pensions we, uh, petitions we still have. Now, Leicester University um, have got an HLF funding project, hopefully, that will start, and that will effectively go through these and digitise them, and we'll cull all the details about where people were, what they were after what loss had they suffered and it'll start to paint a picture just not of the people like Prince Rupert and Cromwell and Fairfax and Charles and all the rest of them you know the the Premier League footballers of the Civil War but actually paints a picture of the ordinary person because this was a war of the ordinary person the person caught in the crossfire 
These petitions tell us about the experience of war right down at root level. In some respects, that's why the other good reason why the National War Centre is in Newark is because we have such good period documents. Because Newark was never taken by Parliament, and usually what happened when a place was taken, it, there was a rampage through the streets, things, records were burnt, knew it was never taken. And when it was taken by dint of surrender in 1646 in May, the plague was in town. So the parliamentarian Scots troops, however teed off the felt about being, you know, six months in a coal field, didn't fancy coming in to Newark to destroy the documents. So we still have the documents. And they were, they were rediscovered, so to speak, a few years ago, reinterpreted by academics. And they tell us very much about the ordinary experience of war, you know, about what parishes were suffering plague deaths, because we've got little crosses beside names. And it paints such a fantastic picture. There's ledgers that go down to somebody claiming they've got soldiers billeted with them who've died of plague and they want payment for the shroud that they provided for the soldier. It's real street level detail. These petitions, welfare petitions, probably will get us down there to that street level again. And again, stop making history about the history of great people. History is about ordinary people. In the Civil War, they find a voice to some extent in people like the levelers. We hear from ordinary people speaking, not great authors or people like Milton or you know, poets or great kings. And that's the really interesting thing about it. This is another fascinating side of the Civil War, is that in order to get the morale up, uh, many would say, within the army, Cromwell actually decided he was going to have representatives from the various regiments, ordinary soldiers on the army council. Yeah, so you get the agitators, essentially. Agitator back then just, just meant an elected repre- a representative of the army, essentially. And, and usually it was the cavalry, start off with, because cavalry we always associate with slightly more intelligent, better off um, 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 chaps, if you like. Um, but, but eventually the infantry regiments had them. And, yeah, and so we actually see a, almost like a blossoming of political ideas. So the army comes quite politicised. Uh, at first the army has grievances about back pay and it's owed a million and a half pounds in '47. I mean, my God, that's a lot of money, isn't it? That's in their, their money. What's that worth today? And, of course, they'd not been indemnified for, for some of the uh, things that had happened in the war and there were some very bad things that happened in the war and they wanted all that. But all of a sudden those disagreements and grievances turned into almost like a political aspiration about the idea that they weren't just a mercenary army, they weren't just hired to fight. So in the, uh, basically in the ranks, the soldiers are murmuring, saying, what the hell are we doing this for? We're not even getting paid, etc. And this was a way of kind of getting, at least diluting that a little bit by letting the fit soldiers feel, anyway, that they had a say in the conduct of the war. Yeah, and I think to some extent the, the grandees of the army had very little choice either. They had a very powerful army. This is the new model army. It's the first professional national army in the history of this country. It's the forerunner of the modern army that we have today. And it was a very, it was a formidable fighting force. And it had become politicised. How are we going to deal with that? So, they, yeah, Cromwell brings them in. And they have the Putney debates. And, uh, but that doesn't necessarily go too far, does it? <laughs> well, I mean, we hear this term, new model army. What, what was it? And, and, and was it... Uh, significant internationally? I mean, what uh, was the Brit- Britain the first to have something like this? No, I think Sweden, from, uh, don't quote me on that, but I think, well, you are quoting me on that, but I think Sweden has a, a professional... I mean, of course, the Scots that come down to fight for Parliament, essentially professional troops, and that, that's what makes them such a... That's really what swings the balance of the, of the English side of the Civil War. But the New Model Army is something completely, completely different. New Model Army is a national army, so it's drawn from all parts, and it will fight nationally. Before then, armies preferred, sometimes refused to fight out of their area, and, of course, would go back when the fields needed ploughing. Well, that's not much good for a professional army. And so the idea was to bring an army together, to thoroughly train it, to pay it properly, to equip it properly. The army is, is by comparison to what went before, is run on a meritocracy. Uh, if you like, so it allowed very able soldiers to rise through the ranks. So you get your russeted coated captains who, who knows what he fights for and loves what he knows. You know, as Cromwell, Cromwell said, and that's what the new model. That's why the new model army is such an effective fighting force. It's got a meritocracy. The most ablest commanders can rise to the top. It's a national army. It's well paid, and effectively, whatever the royalists can put in the field is just simply no match for it. And yes, it is feared through Europe because it's regarded as being a, a very, very powerful force. It only numbers about 25,000 men. But then again, the population of, of Britain at the time, of England at the time, was only 5 million, so multiply that out. And you see, it was actually quite a large army. 
for the days. And effectively, New Model Army effectively never lost a battle. It's a formidable army. Uh, what about those that would look at the Civil War and they'll say, well, actually, this is really just a bun fight between two different factions in the ruling classes and it's nothing really in it for the ordinary folk? Yeah, well, I think that would be wrong. Um, I think that would be wrong. You've... I mean, certainly on, uh, if you think of the 1640s, once war comes, 1642 onwards, there's no censorship. And because there's no censorship, it allows ideas to, to flourish. Some might call that anarchy. If you've got something to lose, you're part of the landed gentry, you might regard that as quite... Well, a you might call thing. it a free press, mightn't you? you call it a free press, and so, yeah, well, that, that's, that's effectively what it is. It's, it, for a while, there's no embedded journalist, there's no... So you have a free press, essentially, and, and out of that whole... Um, idea. Although Parliament does eventually try to introduce censorship, but Parliament's not there as a beacon of truth and liberty all the way through. But nonetheless, there is more liberty. But eventually, you end up with the levellers. Levellers' ideas are very influential. You end up with people like the diggers. The diggers effectively are proto communist socialists that set up on common land and they decide that the levellers don't go far enough. We need more than one man win one vote. We need one person, a fair share of land. That's what we need. These ideas are all emerging in this period, and there are also very strong religious views, fifth monarchists and all these people. So there are loads of things. It's like a flowering of ideas that happens, and I don't think this can ever be forgotten. And I think probably history moves forward in this sort of crab-like way, doesn't it? It's, it's about broadening the power base of society, and the Civil War does that. Effectively, it, it teaches King Charles II that he can't presume like his father did. There's no presumptions anymore. He's always living a little bit by looking over his shoulders, seeing what's happening behind him in a way that probably Charles wasn't, and certainly James didn't. Charles II always has to do that, and of course, within a few decades, the king is booted out of the country, and we get a new king in because we like him better. Things have changed. Bristol um, obviously was defended by the Royalists, it was their key port, um, but the Royalists, once had captured Bristol in, in 43, moved on to Gloucester. And of course Gloucester was one of the, um, the great towns of England at that time, as Bristol was as well, a very important town. Well, if, as I remember it, when William the Conqueror came to Britain, he made his home in Gloucester because he thought it was a, important strategically, you know, sort of controlling movement around the country, Wales and the West Country, that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And of course the West Coast ports anywhere on that side was very, very important. Um, the Royalists desperately want to get over to Gloucester too. It's, I say, it's the high watermark of their fortunes. Um, so they march on it and uh, they get nowhere because uh, unlike Bristol, who parliamentarians didn't defend it necessarily all that well, in the case of Gloucester, they defended it to the last man and they caused all sorts of problems to the Royalists. And the Royalist siege of Gloucester was just a litany. It was like a carry-on. It was a litany of disasters for them to the point where they, they eventually find this great siege gun and float it up the Trent, up the, um, up the Severn, um, to, take down, um, to take down Gloucester. And, of course, it blows up. Killing, killing some of the bombardiers and, and eventually they get so fed up with all their sort of you know bad luck um, the siege gun blows up a, a relief column comes parliamentarian relief column under the Earl of Essex and effectively the royalists just think oh well this is just not going to happen for us we'll just walk away and that's exactly what they do and, and of course Gloucester stays in parliamentarian hands and you see this time and time again across the country you see that um, there are very nearby places that have got completely different allegiances. For instance, in this area, Lincoln was a strongly parliamentarian, and yet Gainsborough, just up the road, was a royalist stronghold. In Nottinghamshire, Nottinghamshire is par parliamentarian, Newark is royalist, um, Bristol becomes royalist, Gloucester is parliamentarian. And it really sort of brings to sharp relief the divisions of that period, not just within um, families, and obviously there are divisions within families, but within nearby communities where there would have been, presumably, Gloucester and Bristol, there would have been a, quite a, you know, an economic link between the two at the time. Well, well, presumably, that had to stop, essentially, because they were on different sides of a war. But I come back to this question about ordinary people, because surely, after all these years of war, for pretty much a decade, uh, they would have been looking for something out of it. What was there for ordinary people? That's a really interesting question. When you start to reduce it to ordinary people, ordinary people are usually the victims of, of great power struggles like this. I suppose what you, 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 you could say, depending on which side of this argument you're on, there were certain things that were introduced by Parliament um, from 42 onwards, which clearly were aimed 
a, a more general population. For instance, in 42, Parliament takes on the responsibility for the health and welfare of its troops. Well, that's good of it, but it hadn't been, happened before. But also their families. So essentially, if you have a look at the timeline for the National Health Service, they actually mention the establishment of the first military hospitals in London by Parliament in '42 as being one of their foundation events, if you like. And, uh, of course, obviously, kings before, and, and when Charles II comes back, all this is, is done away with. But, but for, a, for a period at least, there's this wider recognition that the state should provide um, more than the absolute bare minimum. Um, there's a national pension scheme instituted. It's not perfect, but it's more than what went before. So there are, you could argue, there were, there were steps towards what we might recognise in a modern society being tentatively taken. Now, was that a um, recompense for all the suffering? No, I don't see how it can be, because there was so much savagery. It was such a, a, a bloody war. Um, so many people died. There was such a disruption to the economy of the place. It's very difficult to know. If you're an ordinary person, you probably just wanted the war to finish. I mean, for, for succeeding generations, many point to the Civil War as being really the sort of economic starting point of the Industrial Revolution. And one of the reasons that the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain because it gave quite a lot of power and influence to the merchant classes who wanted to, you know, to at least to be able to spread their wings, to have large labour forces, to build factories, this sort of thing. Yeah, well, it's, it's tempting to think that we got our revolution over very early, and earlier than France, earlier than America, obviously, because America... But we were quite early in, in sorting the problem out of the divine right of kings. Of course, France comes back to it in the next century, and it proves to be, proves to be a very savage episode, if you like. That, um, but in England, I think that's absolutely right, because some of these fundamental, crucial issues about the authority of uh, who rules over a country and who should be consulted... You're right. It, I think it is a, a formative um, part of the entire history of the country and probably does explain to some extent how we end up with the Industrial Revolution first in this country. Other academics around the world point to Britain and say, well, hey, guys, this was really you starting a kind of the first form of national capitalism. There may well be some truth in that. I think what's inter particularly interesting, if you look at a map, um, one of some of the interactives that are in front of us, we actually... Um, ask people to, um, to do a survey to find out which side they would have been on in the Civil War and, and we get them to put their postcode in and so we'll produce um, a map of uh, allegiances in the Civil War period for them to see whether it corresponds with their current view. What you tend to find is that areas, um, urban areas, um, not typically perhaps Bristol but certainly like textile areas of the north of England um, and London a strongly parliamentarian, strongly parliamentarian. That's got to be something to do with the merchant classes. It's got to be something to do with wanting to embrace trade and economy. It just simply has to be something to do with all that. True enough, some of these areas are quite Puritan areas because they traded with Europe and they brought back Protestant ideas, like West Yorkshire places, for instance. But nonetheless, there's obviously an economic zeal abroad in the land and the Civil War is one way in which that, that sort of thing is exercised and it, it comes to some sort of fruition by these areas being staunchly parliamentary. And, of course, the Parliament wins the war and, and England at that point, to some extent, goes from strength to strength in the 1650s. It becomes quite widely respected and feared in Europe. And it's taken as a serious player. It gets its first professional navy, if you like. It's got a, a professional army, new model army and it's interfering with politics on Europe. So it does become quite a big player in the 1650s. For these teachers and these children here today, then, what, what do you think is the real legacy of the Civil War and what are they able to pick up coming to a place like this? Well, I think one of the aims when we set out creating this particular gallery, one of the aims was to try and root it in the experiences of ordinary people, people like these children, what it meant for them, what it was like to live under the crossfire of armies marching in and out marching out. What did the plague mean for communities? You know, and what's been the legacy? Can you bring your packs but leave your costumes and anything else and come and sit in the cinema with me? Bring your packs with you, though. I wish we had history like this when I was a kid. <laughs> Going in the cinema for a morning, fantastic. But um, nobody's pretending the Civil War is an easy period, necessarily. It's not, I mean... Any number of BBC programmes about the Tudors and uh, Richard III, 
and to some extent, from a story point of view, they're, they're much easier to bottle. You know, the Civil War's more difficult. The Civil War happens over four countries, happens over a period of time. There are three distinct elements in that conflict. We've not even talked about Ireland, which is a very complicated situation. You know, then there's all these ideas like the levellers and the diggers. And then you've got this religious aspect about the Puritans, the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians and all this. And it, it looks like a right um, a blamange of stuff. So how do you make sense of that? Well, one way of making sense is literally to root it in the experience of ordinary people. Um, the children have gone in to see the cinema now. And uh, the film Plain, I think, was about the second siege or sorry, the first siege of Newark when Parliament makes a very, very half-hearted attempt to take the town. And it does through from the point of view of ordinary people defending their town. I don't think they were defending it for any high political ideals. They were defending it because somebody was coming to attack them. And it tells it through that story. And I think that's definitely the way in to the Civil War for, for everybody, children and adults, is to consider what it meant for ordinary people like you and I. And then we can branch out from that. You know, which side would you have fought for? It's still a relevant question today, and that's... That's some going. It's not relevant which side you would have been on in the Battles of the Roses, is it? Whether you had been a Lancastrian or a Yorkist, or that's just a totally irrelevant question, because that was a dynastic struggle. There's a sense in which a civil war isn't a dynastic struggle only. It's something more serious and important and long-lasting is going off there, and I think that's that's really what the Civil War Centre set up to say. This really does matter today, and it's a relevant question. Who would you have fought on? And you can't presume that people are going to fight on the parliamentarian side. There are people that think the chaos that ensued after 42 just really wasn't worth it, and it would have been better off just accepting the authority of the king. And I know some very intelligent people that have got that point of view. On the other hand, it quite clearly is the start of Parliament flexing serious muscles and, and getting a real stake in the way the country is governed. And, and really, that, that stake persists to this day. That was Richard Darn from the English Civil War Centre in Newark, in Nottinghamshire, which opened last year, talking about the amazing events over the decade from 1640 to 1650, where tens of thousands of British people, English people mainly, were killed. That's all for this week, Dialects Bristol's first weekly podcast. If you're online, you can subscribe to our emails or download the podcast from dialectradio.co.uk. Thanks to our guests, Sue Jones, talking about the pay gap, also the um, music from Charlotte and Timothy Birchall on piano and violin. That was The Lark Ascending and played live from St Mary Redcliffe Church. And also Richard Darn, you just heard there, from the English Civil War Centre in Newark. Also thanks to studio engineer Dave Bazanko. Dialects of Bristol Broadband Co-op production. Catch us on Bristol Community FM 93.2 every Tuesday at noon and anyone can contribute. Get hold of us through the People's Republic of Stokes Croft, just off Jamaica Street on 0117-909-6897 or prsc.org.uk online. Also, the volunteering sites, Volunteering Bristol, that's one word, volunteerbristol.org.uk or the national volunteering website, that's do-it.org. That was Dialect. And I'm Tony Gosling, wishing you a very good week. Thanks for listening. Till the same time next week, goodbye for now.